Good evening. Good evening. I'm Mark Foreman. I'm the fourth John Ellen Hel Helen Kellogg Dean of Nursing here at Rush, and I welcome you to this evening's Nursing Networks and a discussion on leadership. Rush College of Nursing has a long-standing reputation as a leading academic health science center where the next generation of leaders is born. This reputation is in part evidenced by our 2015 national rankings of our academic programs. Overall, the college is ranked 19th of more than 500 graduate schools of nursing, and our online programming is ranked 13th. Six of our programs are ranked in the top five. Anesthesia is second. Psychiatric Mental Health NP program is third. And our clinical nurse leader, adult gero primary care and adult, adult gero acute care are all ranked fourth. Pediatric Nurse Practitioner Program is fifth, and the Family Nurse Practitioner is twelfth. The remaining academic programs do not have national ranking systems and therefore cannot be ranked. We're looking forward to new rankings being released to the public in early 2016. Other evidence is our, particip our participation as one of five sites of the Graduate Nurse Education Demonstration Project, mandated by the Affordable Care Act. The primary goal of this five-year demonstration project is to increase the number of APRNs to serve as primary care providers to meet the needs of millions more Americans that now have health coverage. The visionary leader of this project knew that an increase in the numbers of APRNs was inadequate in and of itself. So our demonstration project was also designed to gain inroads and opportunities with community-based sites with whom the College of Nursing has not previously worked. As a result, the GNE has created a nurse practitioner hospitalist model at Rush University Medical Center, NP training centers at charity clinics. We've established an immigrant health fellowship program at a federally qualified health center and a psychiatric nurse practitioner training center at a large network of federally funded centers and Spanish language track for NP students interested in working with Spanish speaking communities. Dr. Kathleen Delaney, professor in community systems and mental health nursing, is director of the Rush GNE demonstration project, and she was recently named the 2015 Psychiatric Nurse of the Year. Congratulations, Kathy. We're also actively engaged in a current American Association of Colleges of Nursing initiative to elevate the role of academic nursing and academic health science centers. Dr. Cynthia Barganer, former Chief Nurse Officer and now Chief Operating Officer of Rush University Medical Center, President Goodman and I have been involved in this initiative. Rush is unique across the country in that we are well integrated into clinical operations and AACN considers us a real life exemplar, notably our Center for Clinical Research and Scholarship. This center, under the direction of Dr. Ruth Kleinpel and her team, Dr. Staffolino and Heidt Schmidt, work with staff nurses and APRNs at Rush University Medical Center and Rush Oak Park Hospital to transform clinical practice, enhance clinical education, and position Rush as a national leader that drives evidence-based solutions to clinical problems, tests new models of nursing care delivery, translate research into practice, and foster innovation. When it comes to integrating academic nursing and clinical operations, we are the front runner. In October, the Illinois Nurses Foundation sponsored an inaugural event to celebrate 40 emerging nurse leaders across Illinois. Of the 40, eight or 20% came from within the Rush System for Health, including four faculty from the college, Drs. Amber Kuyath, Fong Kothran, Michelle Haland, and Monique Reed. Earlier this year, Dr. Janet Engstrom, professor and formerly chair of Women, Children, and Family Nursing, was recognized as one of, as part of the 60th anniversary of the American College of Nurse Midwives, as one of seven researchers who has influenced midwifery in the U.S. And then early in November, Dr. Kathy Canterbone, associate professor of adult health and gerontological nursing, assumed the presidency of Sigma Theta Tau International at their biennial conference in Las Vegas. We're really proud of Kathy and her leadership of this prestigious International Nursing Honor Society, and you'll be hearing more from her later in tonight's session. 
And then just moments ago, we hosted a reception in honor of Dr. Margaret Fout Callahan, an alumnus and formerly chair of adult health and director of the nurse anesthesia program as she became provost for health sciences at Loyola University. Clearly these awards, accomplishments, and appointments of our faculty, students, and graduates illustrate that we continue to develop leaders prepared to transform healthcare. And now it's my privilege to introduce one of those transforming healthcare, Dr. Marsha Murphy, Associate Professor in Adult Health and Gerontological Nursing and President of the Nurses Alumni Association. Marsha. Thank you, Dean Foreman. It's so exciting to hear about the many initiatives and accomplishments of the College of Nursing. We are certainly are leading the way in, uh, in multiple fronts. On behalf of the Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's Nurses Alumni Association, I would like to welcome you to our Nursing Networks event this evening. Many of our board members are present today. I'd like to ask them to stand um, for, for us, our Board of Alumni Association Board of Directors. Um, Thank, thank you so much. Thank you for your leadership, your service, and we will have some time for conversation afterward. Please connect with us about alumni association activities. Um, the purpose of nursing networks is twofold, and one purpose is to provide a forum for exhilarating conversation and networking amongst our alumni, faculty, students, nursing leadership, and professional nursing staff, and secondly, to hear uh, about a whole variety of current health care topics. So we have a, a very exciting uh, evening planned for you. We have nursing leaders sharing their stories about their leadership trajectories. So I have the distinct privilege to introduce our uh, panel members and presenters this evening. Kathy Katrenbone is an associate professor at Rush University College of Nursing and on faculty in the DMP and PhD programs. Dr. Katrenbone is an, also an alumnus of the College of Nursing, having received both her MSN and PhDs at Rush. She is president, as you've just heard, of Sigma Theta Tau International Honor Society of Nursing and is a leader of the uh, Sigma Theta Tau International Global Advisory Panel for the Future of Nursing. She chairs the Illinois Department of Public Health, Illinois Asthma Partnership, that executes the Asthma Strategic Plan for Illinois, Dr. Ketchumbone is also a fellow in the American Academy of Nursing and Institute of Medicine, Chicago. We also have Pat Polanski here with us tonight, and thank you for joining us at Rush. Uh, Pat Polanski is Director for Program Development uh, and Implementation for the Center to Champion Nursing in America, an initiative of AARP, the AARP Foundation, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Pat Polanski was executive director of the New Jersey Board of Nursing, co-founded a healthcare consulting firm, and worked in executive management roles at New Jersey hospitals for more than 20 years. She is the recipient of the Governor's Nursing Merit Award and the Outstanding Alumna Designation from the University of Pennsylvania's College of Nursing, among many, many other honors. I could go on and on with these um, introductions, uh, but without further ado, um, I have Dr. Katrenbone first uh, join us. Thank you. We're just going to turn down the lights so you can see the slides a little better. Uh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here this evening. And I just want to start off by saying that the Rust Presbyterian St. Luke's Nursing Alumni Association is a very special organization to me. Um, as Marcia noted, I have received two of my degree, degrees from the College of Nursing and served many years on the Board of Directors. Um, I greatly value my education and I think it had a very strong influence on my leadership trajectory and career. Also, I just would have to say that the Rush alumni are the greatest alumni because no matter where you go in the country or in the world, when you meet with them, they are so excited to meet with you and to do whatever they can to help you in ways that are important to you. Okay, so I thought I would start off um, my presentation with a quote by Lo Zhu, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right, that I think is really uh, very fitting. A journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And what I'll be doing is sharing my leadership journey in Sigma Theta Tau that has spanned over a decade. 
um, it's hard to believe I'm 10 years older now as I'm looking back on this. But, um, and I intentionally have a picture of Rush in the background because I've learned from, I've been inspired, been mentored and supported by so many of my colleagues over at the hospital as well and in the College of Nursing, and I'm very grateful for that as well. Leadership has always been very important to me. Um, there have been two things that have been, uh, uh, I've aspired to over the course of my career. And the first being that I always knew in nursing that I wanted to, to serve a local health, uh, an organization with a local health mission. And secondly, w wanted to serve um, as a leader in a national or international organization. And my journey, I think, has been built on all that I've learned, um, certainly through my education, learning about leadership theory, leadership styles, understanding strengths and leadership's traits. And I certainly value the tenets of servant and transformational leadership, emotional intelligence, and have used appreciative inquiry in planning the trajectory of my career. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about those, but rather what I would like to share with you, in addition to those, there are a few basic guiding principles that have really served me well over my life. And they're very simple, but there's great depth in terms of how I've implemented them in my life. The first is identify and aggressively pursue what you feel passionate about. You only have 24 hours to your day, so you may as well dedicate it to something you feel very strongly about. Be intentional about your journey, and I think part of that is being, being thoughtful about um, the, the plan, the trajectory of your journey. And I think what you will be interesting between Pat and I is we, we took totally different approaches, and they both work very well for us based on who, who we are as persons and as leaders. Um, do your homework, understand the importance of relationships, and seek mentors along the way for the many needs that you will have. I just want to say a few words about my service in a local uh, organization. I have been very committed to the Respiratory Health Association of Metropolitan Chicago. My clinical passion is lung health and caring for patients with chronic lung disease. I was very fortunate to have my mentor, Ellen Elpern, early in my career, and she introduced me to the organization. And their tagline at the time was, when you can't breathe, nothing else matters. And their mission to promote healthy lungs and fight lung disease through research, advocacy, and education. And I have to say that those were so ins inspirational to me and have really been what has motivated me in terms of the advocacy and policy work that I've done here in Chicago and Illinois. I worked for many years in um, advocating for smoke-free environments and happy to report that after 30 years, we are now celebrating our fifth anniversary of being smoke-free in Chicago and in Illinois. And now what we've gone on to do is we've expanded that to smoke-free housing, campuses, and smoke-free parks. Now I'll share a little bit about my journey in Sigma Theta Tower International. And I thought the approach that I would take was to share my journey in terms of the elected positions that I've served in. And it started at the local, then went to the regional, and to the international level. I'll share a little bit about the position, um, some of the key leadership initiatives that I was instrumental in and helped in terms of moving the organization forward, and also some of the challenges along the way. I was inducted as a member in the Gamma Phi chapter at Rush University as a graduate student and felt actually very fortunate to be a part of that chapter. I felt an honor in being part of something larger um, than my clinical practice area and being part of an international organization. And I, at that point in my career, I was ready for a leadership position and then uh, put myself forward to and was elected as um, chapter president. And I was immediately, again, I think I'm some, someone that's, that gets immediately captivated by things, but I was very captivated by the mission of Sigma Theta Tau International. This is our revised version from this by any, but still is very similar. Advancing world health, so our, we have a very a global health mission, and celebrating nursing excellence and scholarship, leadership, and service. And our vision being to be the global organization of choice for nurses. Uh, some, I served as chapter president for two years. Um, I, I think one of the things that I appreciate about our board was that we have both good representation from the hospital and the College of Nursing, and we're highly engaged in programming, networking, and service projects in the community and abroad. And some of my challenges during that time included leadership succession planning and member retention, something that's not unique to Sigma Theta Tau, certainly. For those of you who are not familiar with the organization, we have 135,000 members in over 90 countries around the world. Um, and 48, 485 chapters worldwide. 
And it really wasn't until I attended the biennial convention, and that's the photo here on, the, um, on your right-hand side, that I really appreciated the magnitude and scope of what the organization was all about and the human and intellectual capacity, uh, capital that would help drive the organization's mission. And it was at that time, at attending that biennial convention, that I made the decision that Sigma Theta Tau International would be the organization of choice for me in terms of my leadership trajectory. And as I said, um, in, in my guiding principles, one of the things is, is to plan to plan your journey. And at that point in time, I met with the international staff at headquarters, spent time talking with some of the leaders of the organization, and really plotted my journey um, through Sigma, uh, through the organization. And the one thing that I always kept in the back of my mind is that always knowing that regardless of the outcome, that I would serve the organization in some fashion. So after serving as chapter president, went on to, to be a Regional 5 coordinator. Uh, what my role as a, a coordinator was is working with the chapter presidents. And I felt that that was an important position for me, knowing that I would want to serve at, at, at the board level and is having a, a very detailed understanding of what um, happens at the chapter and the regional level. And so I was responsible for working with the chapter leaders. The territory that I covered, and this is an interesting territory, I had 37 chapters in Illinois, Missouri, Pakistan and Brazil. <laughs> so kind of an interesting combination. But what it helped me to appreciate is that while we were similar in terms of our needs in many ways, there are also great differences regionally that needed to be taken into account in terms of the leadership at that level. I worked very hard in creating a regional identity. I helped the chapter leaders come together and to form relationships, to share information, to share programming and resources and to, that I felt would help to contribute to their vitality and health as chapters and as regions. Um, some of my challenges in that role included, given that this was a volunteer um, service position, that there was really great variability in the chapter leaders in terms of their level of experience and their commitment to service. And so I had to work collectively and individually with the chapter leaders to help them realize their goals as well as to meet the bylaw requirements of, uh, of being a chapter in good standing. Another important focus um, as a uh, chapter uh, regional coordinator was helping the chapters contribute to the Millennium Development Goals. As you know, we are a global organization with, with a um, global health mission and helped the uh, chapter leaders in terms of, of service projects both locally and abroad to address the Millennium Development Goals. Um, how many of you are familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals that were just released or just approved this past September? Okay. I just want to make mention of those. They were adopted. Um, they were adopted in September, and we are moving on. There are 17 goals, each with specific targets, and I think they come to about 167 targets. So it's quite an advancement from what we um, focused on in terms of the Millennium Development Goals. The third goal relates directly to health and it's to ensure healthy lives and to promote the well-being for all at all ages. And although the others don't specifically mention health, they do have health-related implica implications. For example, no hunger, gender equality, clean water, sanitation, and clean energy. And the major emphasis for the sustainable development goals will be to end poverty, to protect the planet, and to ensure prosperity for all people and, and with the hopes of achieving this by the, the year 2030. The next step in the progression of my leadership in Sigma Theta Tau was then to become the Regional Chapter Coordinating Committee Chair, the RCCC Chair. Uh, my husband makes fun of that abbreviation all the time. But um, anyways, in, in that position, um, what, was, uh, what I valued greatly is that I was then a member of the Board of Directors at the international level. And it was my responsibility to represent the voice of the chapters and the regions to the Board of Directors. And I think what was particularly important um, for that is at that time in our, um, our state as a society, we were focusing very intentionally on our uh, becoming more international as an organization. So I was able to bring the perspective of the chapters and the regions to the Board of Directors as they made important decisions regarding um, the organization. It was also my responsibility to oversee the 15 regional coordinators that provided support to the 485 chapters um, around the world. 
My challenge in that position was uh, it was a lot to learn and to digest. Uh, being engaged in strategic decision making at the board level. And I realized at that time how North American centric I was and how much I had to learn about the world in order to serve in that capacity. Um, two important initiatives that we accomplished during uh, my tenure as the RCC chair was number one is uh, making a recommendation to the board of directors in terms of a regional restructuring. When you think about it, with our 485 chapters, um, all, the, all the regions were, uh, were situated within the United States. So, so chapters outside of the United States reported to chapters within North America. And what we proposed to the board of directors, which then got passed, was a restructuring of, of the chapters based on the UN structure so that the chapters then we established six regions and the chapters resided in those regions um, were, were, um, were consistent in that geographical area. The other, the other accomplishment during the tenure was also looking at a chapter health process. Um, being that the chapters are the foundation of the organization and that their roles and responsibilities are very clearly outlined in the bylaws. And at that time, we really did not have a consistent approach to how uh, we dealt with chapter health. And so what working with the group of regional chapter coordinators that we did recommend a chapter health process, which um, has since then been adopted at International. Um, it systematized how we address chapter health and how we work consistently with the chapter leaders. And it did have a major impact in terms of our numbers of chapters that are now in good standing within the organization. Then moving on to the position of vice president, um, being a member of the executive committee, uh, uh, my responsibilities in that role included um, board oversight. So it involved direction setting and strategic planning and establishing priorities for the organization, overseeing governance, policy setting, our fiduciary responsibilities, maintaining stakeholder relationships and, addre and addressing the operational performance management issues of the organization. Two important things that occurred during, um, during that um, time period is, uh, first of all, you can, as, again, you can appreciate, given our global health mission, our visibility and involvement within the United Nations. In 2008, we were granted NGO status, which means that we, um, that we were allowed to be observers within the United Nations. Um, however, in 2012, a major accomplishment for our organization, we did achieve ECOSOC status, which, um, which is special consultative status within the Economic and Social Council. And it gave us the opportunity to provide expert analysis on nursing issues, to help advance the United Nations goals, to provide written and oral statements addressing nursing and global health at the UN level, and to serve on UN-related health committees. Five minutes to go. Thank you. And our focus has been on maternal child health. The other major initiative as vice president is we um, did transition um, to a strategic plan. For some of you who have had history with the organization, we did have what we called the Vision 2020, which was our first look at developing um, a roadmap to our intentional growth as a global organization. We called ourselves international, but at that time, 97% of our members were from um, uh, we're inside North America. So we worked during that time period with a, with a global strategist to look at our international growth and how to take the organization to the next level. And then finally, as president-elect, um, which Marcia alluded to in her introduction, is we launched the Global Advisory Panel on the Future of Nursing. And the goal of this initiative is to establish a global voice and vision for the future of nursing that will advance global health. Um, our strategy is to bring stakeholders together first globally and then regionally to look at the future of global health and the nursing profession. We had our inaugural uh, meeting uh, this past, uh, in March of 2014 in um, Basel, Switzerland. Um, Dr. Martha Hill, who is the Dean Emerita from John Hopkins University, served as the chair. And we had very good global representation at this inaugural meeting. President from the International Council of Nursing, the director of the World Health Collaborating Centers for Global Health and um, Nursing Networks, the president and CEO of JAPIGO, the chair for the Lancet Commission on the Status of Nursing in the United Kingdom, and that's just to mention a few. And the key issues that we addressed as global leaders were to identify the key issues related to nursing and global health and to establish those priorities. 
We are now in the process of hosting regional meetings where now we bring together nursing leaders from the various regions of the world to talk about these key uh, priority areas and to look at them in terms of how they relate to the areas where they, um, where they operate. And our next phase then we will launch into the action phase where we bring together regulators, ministers of health and stakeholders to help us identify, prioritize and develop action plans by region and metrics to be able to gauge our success. And then finally, working on the call to action. I, I've never had children, but this was like giving birth. From the moment I got that piece of paper that said, you are president-elect, I started thinking about the call to action. And the call to action is a vision for the organization in the biennium. Um, it builds upon the strategic plan, and it provides a mechanism for chapters, regions, uh, um, and members to engage in the strategic plan for the organization. And my call to action uh, for 2015-2017 is to influence to advance global health and nursing. And when you think about the 19 million nurses and midwives worldwide, we met, represent the largest group of healthcare professionals. We are woven into every element of healthcare, and we use our knowledge, expertise, and relationships to advocate for and to lead systems um, to improve global health. The four theme areas for my call to action include influence through advocacy, with an emphasis on developing advocacy expertise, engaging in advocacy, and fostering advocacy relationships. Influence through policy to embrace opportunities to create, influence, evaluate, and mo modify policy at the bedside, boardroom, and within community, health, and governmental organizations. Influence through lifelong learning, both personally and professionally, as it enhances our value and impacts our ability to influence. And then finally, influence through philanthropy that includes giving of time, talent, and charitable donations. I love quotes, and I'd like to share another quote uh, inspired by Ursula Le Guin that speaks to the importance of the journey. It's good to have, it's good to have an end to the journey, uh, it's, sorry, it's good to have an end to journey toward, but it's a journey that matters in the end. And I would just say, as I, as I noted earlier, the importance of a leadership legacy plan. This is certainly something that um, I developed um, early on in my career and, and continually work toward. I keep it on my desktop. Um, and I would have to say that as important as it is to plan, at least or as it, for me as it been, um, to plan the trajectory, also to be open to opportunities as they arise um, along, along the way because it may be a good match for your talents and give you the opportunity um, to make a difference also in the world. I want to take a moment to thank the outstanding mentors that I've had um, in my tenure here at Rush. I will be celebrating my um, 37th anniversary and certainly Dr. Luther Christman who we all know. Um, what I learned from him is the importance of um, getting your doctorate in nursing and, be, and having parity with other health professionals. Dr. Joanne Dish, who actually hired me as a new, uh, a new nurse and taught me humi humility. And it's not about you as a leader, but those you serve in helping them to achieve their full potential and to make a difference in the world. And then to, uh, after joining the College of Nursing in 2007, I wanted to thank Dr. Margaret Falk Callahan, who we honor today. Uh, Dr. Mark Foreman, where is he? And Dr. Elizabeth Carlson here in the front, who are my department chairs. And I, they encouraged me to pursue the journey. They helped me to think strategically and expand my thinking beyond the boundaries of North America and to provide, and they provided the support that I needed to pursue my dreams um, in Sigma Theta Tau International. And thank you. And I was just on time, and I'll leave you with my final and most favorite quote by Mahatma Gandhi, is be the change. I'm thrilled to be here, and I, um, I know one of the reasons I'm here is uh, Jen Cooper here in the, in the front, front um, who uh, our lives collided, and uh, she's the future of nursing, I think, and a Rush alum, so you produce the best here. I also wanted to say that I did experience all day today Rush spirit. I go all over every state I've been in. I can't tell you. And you can feel it here. So good for you because that means everything and it, it's, it's just so important. Well, I have, a, I have a very different story to tell. And uh, I had no plan. 
I had no idea what I was going to be when I grew up. I knew I was going to be, oh, I'm sorry. She's going to fix it. There you go. Um, I knew uh, you recognized me smiling. This is back when you were 35 years ago. Um, but quite honestly, when we had our capping ceremony, I, um, the, the director of nursing, which is what they were called then, who lit the candle when I walked up, she sat up on the stage. And I do remember this. I sat there and I thought, hmm. That would be something to try and be, but I'll never be that. That job was 37 years ago in my life. Don't ever limit yourself by thinking you can't be, you won't be, you don't know what you want to be, because sometimes it picks you. Um, this, is, this is my trip, a very long trip, bedside to boardroom. I was a blood and guts, surgical, open heart, cancer, nurse, 3 to 11 supervisor, believe me, did it all at the bedside. Never ever imagined I would be an assistant commissioner of health for a state with 8.5 million people like New Jersey, a top 10 state like Illinois is in terms of population, or that I'd be in Washington, D.C. right now helping lead two big pillars, leadership and education as a result of an Institute of Medicine report. Life takes you in funny places, and that's kind of how I got there. But I would say I've had these kind of three little, not themes, but three things I believe in at work. You have to help coordinate things. It's not somebody else's job. It's your job. And by helping do that, that's how you learn, and that's how people learn about you. Collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. You can't shake enough hands, introduce yourself enough, or be there. Whatever be there means, and we'll talk more about that. And integrating. Integrating what you know into where you are. I think those are key to leadership. And they were key in my life, but I will tell you they're more key now. Because when you look at the whole country, you can't get people to move uh, in any particular direction just because you think it's the way to go. People have to want to go there. They have to want to follow you, and leadership is about that. Um, this is a graphic um, I just actually found, but I have taught this. Um, I've committed myself. I was on faculty probably a total of about eight years full-time faculty, but I have taught every year of my professional career, and in the last five or six, just about 380 DMP students. And I tell them all, you have to put on a management headset. If you want to lead, you have to manage. You're managing other people. You're managing yourself. You're managing your environment. You're, imagining, um, you're managing others who are in that environment. And they're not always people you like. They're not always people who like you. And they may not even like what you do, but they may smile at you at all those committees you've been sitting at for 20 years. But that doesn't mean they're going to move your agenda. In order to do that, you have to lead. And in order to do that, you have to get this headset on. I think leaders, and this I didn't know about myself, um, quite honestly. But I think I am someone who had um, innate management talent which help the leadership journey. And I think you all know there are people that just, they can just lead. It's like a natural state for them. I'm not saying you can't learn it because you can. And an example, I'll give you just one example in my life that I learned, and that is I had to take remedial math to get into nursing school. I, I'm a three-year grad that went up the, the line. But when I got that job, my first job is a director of nursing, and I realized I didn't know diddly squat about finance, I went to Wharton at UPenn, and I got a certificate in finance. And when I left, when I was an assistant commissioner, I managed a $2 billion budget. A $2 billion budget five years ago. A half a billion dollar budget when I was the CEO 
at a hospital in New Jersey. So you, you may have the talent, you may want to do it, but none of you in this room would think of being the oncology nurse and not knowing the drugs or learning how to do it. But everybody seems to think that everybody can just become this great leader manager person without schooling, without taking some courses, without learning it. You have to seek that out. You have to make that where, where your weaknesses are. The people skills. You, it might be natural for you, but believe me, there's a lot of theory out there, and the more, the merrier. I think today's leaders are these three things. And I think anyone who's ever known me in, in my life, in I can't even tell you how many <laughs> different positions. In the hospital, I went as the director of nursing. I ended up as the CEO um, 16 years later. And, I, you know, I've managed 10,000 employees. I've managed 62 department heads. I've managed an entire division in the state of New Jersey, health, that $2 billion division. Strong. You have to be strong, um, really. And strong means energetic. Strong means strong-willed. You have to have some stick to You have to be able to articulate in a very clear way what you're leading, what you believe in, where you want them to go, how you want them to follow you. So strength is on all those levels. Innovative. This, I cannot tell you now, I was in your Sim Center today, and during the tour I'm like, this is, you know, like texting. This is an OMG for somebody like me, who when I looked down the hallway of your new ER and saw what's going on in that Sim, I'm thinking, seriously? And this is something I say practically every speech, just to center you on the journey. I'm before CPR. I am. I'm Pulp Fiction. When I was an open heart nurse, we didn't have telemetry units. At the University of Pennsylvania, one of your partners for GNE, right? And somebody coded, you called the resident, you went down, cut his chest open, ch -ch -ch, hope the heart started, and your job was to clean up. Your job was to clean up. So, you know, along the way, Innovation is coming at us like guns blazing here. And nurses need to step up and not think of where we were before, but we need to lead to where healthcare is going. I'm an old hockey mom. I am an old hockey mom. You know, the old Wayne Gretzky thing? Go where the puck is. Go where the puck is. The puck is all the way out there. It's in your cell phone, and we're still teaching fundamentals the same way we did 45 years ago. So lead. If you're on faculty, lead. And I think that's been a characteristic of mine uh, that people would say, that I'm kind of visionary and I'm going to be out there. The other thing is nimble. You have to move fast. And today, <laughs> however fast I used to move, really, it's just like running a race today. You have to be very nimble. Nimble means, you know, being able to listen to others and lead them in ways that they think or they're trying to tell you. you. You have to, that's a nuance rather than just, here we go, we're going here, here's our, you know, list of 12 things that we need to do. Now, that being said, you still need to do the 12 things. Leaders used to be, and this, this is very true, and I think, you know, of some of the things that, again, I have learned, but are very true. Leaders used to be people who were told to keep a lid on things. Keep it calm, keep them there, have them go over it. We don't want people upset. We don't want all that. And they would run a good ship. These are old expressions. Still used, still used in management circles. And obviously, you run a good ship here. But today, this is the leadership word of today. And I am now working at ARP with the new president, the first woman president in about 30 years there. Moniker for her legacy is to disrupt aging. And every major new book that's out is talking about disrupting. 
Now, disrupting doesn't mean to be, you know, a bull in a china shop. Disrupting means maybe we need to stop doing it that way and do it this way. And so funny, I was putting this together and I'm like, it brought me back to a gentleman who, when he hired me, um, right after I got my master's, he hired me and he was the youngest CEO in the state at the time. And honest to God, I finished this thing tonight and I'm scrolling like about midnight and I see this last name and I go, Victor? I don't know, it was very serendipitous that he somehow just discovered where I am because he left New Jersey and went, went around. But if you can find the right person to work with and for, your leadership just accelerates. Because he would say, like this, it's football season. Some of you don't even know four, four downs from whatever. But you all know, get the ball, the quarterback calls the signals, and the idea is to get the ball into the end zone, right? Leadership is a contact sport. I, and I'm not just telling you what the elements are. I'm telling you that I have taught management and leadership for about 40 years. And I made a promise to myself that when I watched other leaders, that I was going to practice what I preached. So what I am telling you is what I have practiced that I have learned and preached. And this is a contact sport. And I'm going to run down and tell you why. Number one, you have to talk to people face to face. This is great, the texting and all this. You want to see what that person, your subordinate, that other person, another unit, that doctor, head of surgery, pick yourself up and walk down. More important now than when I did it. Because you cannot communicate everything in this texting thing. It's not going to get the job done if you want to really get yourself somewhere. Because it's, leadership is personal. Leadership is a personal journey, just like you were just saying. But it's personal between you and your board, between you and the people you work with, between you and somebody who you hire. It's, it's very personal. You need to give them the ball. I have written across the bottom in big yellow letters here, delegate. Nurses aren't good at this. If, you, if the person they're leading doesn't do it fast enough, they do it for them. Ahead of them because they can't wait. Big lesson in leadership and a lesson I have learned and I have preached to subordinates and said, like, Nancy, you don't delegate enough. You need to give your power away. And the more power you give away, the more um, you get done. It is just amazing. It is just amazing. These were management theories going back decades ago. And um, I'm somebody who likes to get a lot of things done. And um, you can't do it all yourself. So I started giving it away. And when I started giving parts of my job away, there was so much more I got done. And I was like, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. So I think delegation is something leaders should do more. Do more, do more, do more, do more. Um, it's about moving the ball. It's about moving the ball. And today, especially, it's not about the status quo. Your organization, your sim lab, your ER, I could name anything that uh, I learned today being here, is all about the fact that Rush is out there. Rush is not where it was five years ago, ten years ago. Rush is out there thinking about where is the next thing. Um, you have to learn the tactics, just like football players have to learn the plays. There's a way you deal with the chief of surgery. There's a way you deal with the brand new nurse. There's a way you deal with your supervisor. There's a way you deal with the dean. There's a way. You have to learn what the rules of the road are and practice them. And if you practice, the more you get good at it, and then you get elevated. I have not, this is the truth, I have not looked for a job since 1979. I have been tapped on the shoulder over and over and over, come across the street, how about being the supervisor, how about being the assistant director, how about being this, how about being that. Because once you prove yourself, people seek you out. People seek you out to try to find where you are. 
Um, the other thing is, if you're going to be bold and do those things I told you, you're going to be in a risk situation. I have been fired twice. Most famous people have been fired twice. Or three times. Coaches get fired all the time, right? What's the phrase? Fire the coach. It's not about the team, it's about you. I learned more. Um, the first time it was like a death. People came to my house and they brought me flowers and I'm like, this, this must be what it's like to die. No, I'm serious, I'm serious. But it was this you know, controversy between the CEO and, the, and another, another person who wanted me not to get the job. And he just chose her. But I learned a lot from that. So, you know, in other times you take a risk as a leader, you know, you, you risk that, you risk that too. But that's okay. I have up on the top here, Generations Matter. Uh, you might want to look up, those of you who are, love to Google, look up a company called Generations Matter. We had this gentleman come, uh, I had him come last year to the summit uh, for the Campaign for Action last year. And one of the things that I think, as a leader, I have kind of always embraced is um, just because they're all nurses or doctors doesn't mean they were all the same. Uh, and you know they're not the same, but right now generational differences make a big difference in leadership. And right now Google itself put out a, a, an amazing article because millennials, who are the new, you know, they're going to be the biggest, most powerful new group um, since the boomers, and even more so, they believe. Millennials are used to a lot of praise. Remember, they're raised by helicopter mothers, and they've been told just breathing, so good job, good job. <laughs> Everything they did, they did well, right? The losing 17 should go to a, anything with these kids. They, the ninth place team gets a trophy. What does that do when you get you know, into work? Well, Google's looking at changing their entire performance appraisal process based on this. Because millennials, once a year evaluation just isn't going to do it for them. So leadership has to change, and we have to change with it. And I can tell you over my life, I don't recognize the workplace I'm in now. Um, like, you know, I was comfortable in the old workplace. And it's not just that I'm the older one now, it's that it's very egalitarian and the rules aren't as clear. So when you're a leader, leader and the rules aren't quite so clear, it's harder to lead. This is my favorite only quote and I had the distinct privilege not only to meet Peter Drucker who is, Peter Drucker for those of you who do not know, is to management what Maslow is to hierarchy of needs and I do not exaggerate. And this is the best definition. I've looked at every definition, every book, you know, 50 books a year I review. Management is influencing people to get things done. And when you do that, you are the leader. You can't take six Boy Scouts out for a weekend without a scout leader. Bring your pack, bring your bag, da 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 or be the President of the United States. And I say this all the time, and Jen has heard this multiple times. If I ever stop working, my book is going to be titled, It's All About Leadership. So I don't think anything happens in the world without it being led, and led well. And organizations like this have a history of being well led. I am old enough, I, mean, I worked with Luther Christman, not here, but on committees and different things back in the day. Once-in-a-lifetime man, once-in-a-lifetime leader. While I didn't have the privilege of being here, I remember Luther said. So, you know, you're, you're always preceded, preceded by someone. But what's the good news that I'm learning and you're learning and um, there are a lot of new books out and that is that good leaders uh, don't have to be good anymore. Meaning, traditional good. Um, Jim Collins started this back in 2001 with the book Good to Great. And they then did Good to Great for social organizations. I'm just going to rattle off a couple of names. Donald Trump, Jeff Bezos, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Jack Welch. These are not shy, quiet, retiring, 
Mamby Pamby, I'm not going to tell you what I think, people. And if you haven't seen the recent two or three movies about the more contemporary people, you should go. Because leaders, it's, if you're too mild-mannered, if you're too meek, if you're too mamby-pamby, um, you, you can't lead the way you should. And there was a management theory that uh, goes back about 35 years, and, and you were supposed to give your employees when, when you got promoted, you were supposed to ask them to list the five characteristics of their most favorite boss. And it is true for 50 years of, of research that I am aware of, not everything, of course, but some of it, that people would rather work for a tyrant than a dish wreck. That's management phraseology. Because at least you know where they're coming from and you know what they're going to do. I'm not saying you should be a tyrant or that charging rhino, but you need to, to be defined and you need to be strong. And sometimes the things you do, your employees don't think is good. They, they don't agree. I remember when I got the first job in the hospital and I got promoted to the vice president the first time, they were like, she doesn't care about us anymore. She doesn't even come up. She wouldn't even make a bed. And I remember sitting down in the office go, now I'm going to be defined by whether or not on a bad day on 2 North, I go up there and help them, you know, put people to bed. But that's what happens as you accelerate up through the piece of, you know, that, that whole attitude. I put a lot on one slide because obviously I could talk for an entire semester on leadership. Leaders do two things, and people have always told me, and it's interesting, when I went to Washington, I heard from more people in my life than I'd ever heard before. Students, people who used to work for me, and they all said, you motivated me to do this or that, I go back to school or whatever it was. Good leaders motivate, and I believe in it. So I was a cheerleader in high school, and I'm still a cheerleader in Washington. We can do it. We're going to get there. 80-20, you betcha. Don't give up. Come on, let's go. It's a characteristic of leaders, and I think it's a characteristic that has, um, I have learned is really good. And you have to inspire people. And you can only do this if you believe in it, just like what you heard. You know, if you believe in what you're doing, then you can inspire people. But those two things create the culture in which you manage. And I don't care. I managed the hospital, no joke. I managed the hospital. We had a building project. I managed the hospital in what was um, a janitor's uh, closet that I had him clean out and take the sink out on an overbed table for two and a half years. You do not have to have the big corner office to lead. But they have to know you are leading and that you have that investment. And the way they know it is communicating. So communicating and delegating, those are my two bywords. Um, if anything, people would accuse me of over-communicating. I have to honestly say, I've always told it like it is. The sky's falling. I said, they're telling you the sky's not falling. I'm telling you, get an umbrella, the sky is falling. But this is what we're going to do because the roof may come down. So it's been, that's kind of been a personal philosophy of mind along the way. I, it's generally worked. I think it generally worked. Um, Peter Drucker had one other phrase that uh, really is very appropriate for today and for leadership um, that I also um, embrace. And that is culture eats strategy for lunch every single day. Culture is the hardest thing to change. You come in as a new leader, whatever the rush culture is or whatever, you either have to embrace it, get in with it, or slowly move people in a new direction. Because you come in and try to say, uh, out with that and in with this because I'm here now, that's probably not going to work. It's probably not going to work. So just, you know, again, a couple of things that, that kind of work well. Um, when I was, um, one of the things, I, a woman who worked for me came for a meeting to D.C. 
And this will just tell you, so uh, 16 years ago, I took this new job in government. I got recruited into government, was never going to do it. I'm there, and I didn't know anything about um, the Department of Health, really, you know, in terms of leading it. So I told the secretary I was going to interview everybody in the division. I was going to go out to every county in New Jersey and all this. And she said, really? I said, yeah. She said, how long do you think this is going to take? I said, it may take a year or so. It took me a year and a half. I did 200 meet and greets. This woman that was there, when she introduced me three weeks ago in D.C., she said, Pat was the only assistant commissioner that ever came out to the counties and met them. She did 200 meet and greets. Now, I never told them I did 200, but somehow she knew I did 200, because the secretary is probably still talking about it. You have to go out. Hi, I'm Pat. Who are you? What do you do? Stick your hand out and get out. Whatever out is, talk to the students, talk to the doctors, talk to the administration, talk to the guy who runs the parking lot, Talk to Sergio, who just gave me my drink, whose thing is up here, but he was down there. How you doing tonight? How's it going? It's a contact sport. It's a face-to-face. -face. And that is just something that's a natural place where I live, so it's worked for me. But I will tell you, it can work for you if you aspire to um, bigger and better things. This is the now, you know, when I was coming up, there was no such thing as a C-suite, but now there is. Like I said, I never imagined I'd ever, ever, ever be board chair, staffing chairs. Really, I found myself in Washington when I was assistant commissioner, when I was assistant commissioner, up on stage, 5,000 people, Secretary Frist, me representing the whole country. Never thought that would happen. If you get there, you go with it. You get there, you run with it. All of you won't get there. I didn't plan on getting there. But if you do, you take it to the house, like they say in football. Because I used to manage, what, 3 to 11, I worked nights, 20 people on a floor. Then I was in ICU, too. I went to New Jersey. People said to me, what do you do? I told them, they said, oh, do you miss nursing? I go, no. I used to take care of two very sick people. Now I'm responsible for eight and a half million people. And if I make a good nursing decision, it changes the life of all those people. And guess what? Now I'm in DC, and we're the implementation arm of the Campaign for Action. And we just made this historic change. That pillar of education, I've been responsible for that pillar. First time in the history of nursing in 75 years more baccalaureate prepared nurses than associate degree nurses. You can do it. If you get there, go. So now, we do this for 350 million people. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's new motto is, a culture of health for all America. You'll find yourself there. You'll find yourself there. And if you get launched from this place, no reason. And, whoops, sorry, press the button too soon. It's another one of my favorite phrases, stretch. Stretch yourself. Nature pours a vacuum, stretch. You know what you learned in physics, and you go like that, and when you pull it out further, it starts to get that tension. When you feel that tension in here, you know you're leading. That's when you know you're leading. When you're stretching you, when you're stretching the organization, when you're stretching it out, and you're stretching them out. And those people will come back to you and say, my life is different because you allowed me to grow, to breathe, to this, to that. So again, thank you so much for the privilege of being here. I hope we have a nice dialogue during your Q&A and my little life lessons. And I told Jen, I did this. This is the outline for my book. So if I ever hit the press, you would have heard it here first. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Jen, to turn that off. Wow. Those were inspiring presentations. Uh, we have uh, several minutes in our program this evening for questions. Um, clearly, to uh, esteemed leaders, you know, we have uh, here today. Um, anyone has a question? Brave. Somebody must have a question. Look, I don't have any questions. 
It's the wine. Yeah. The egg rolls. Wine and the egg rolls. Oh my god, no questions. That's a bad sign. Okay, I'll pose a question. You both mentioned um, in different ways seizing opportunities. Despite at that moment in time, you may not feel you have the knowledge, the skills, the wherewithal to do whatever that opportunity is. Share with us a bit more about that, if you will, because I, I think that that is something many many of us face. You know, we're we're asked to do something that may seem to be a, you know, reach or certainly in one's busy schedule. Um, wow, is it an opportunity or is it you know? more work that may not fit within the schedule. Since this is a family gathering, I will be very candid with my response. Um, you know, one of the things for me that's been the biggest challenge in the role um, as uh, being on the board is um, public speaking. And mm -hmm. I've had to put a lot of effort and time working with an executive coach, um, learning how to put presentations together, and learning how to give them. I often make a joke at, you know, at home is I'd rather do a strip tease than give a presentation. <laughs> so I thank God that I have gotten over that. But I would have to say that has been a major stretch for me. And um, and then my husband will say, well, you just put yourself on the world stage. He said, is your next move going to be you're going to throw yourself in front of a bus? <laughs> so anyway, so for me, that, mm -hmm. that I would that's how I would reply. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I gave you the one example, which is prime, primal of the uh, budget thing. But I mm -hmm. would say, um, not so much volunteering, but I did a lot of what um, you had indicated. I started back in my district for my state nurses association and just felt like you had to give back and you should do something. And then along the way, you kind of learn the skills mm -hmm. of, uh, that go with leadership. And uh, actually, I mentioned to you the pillar that the other pillar I'm in charge was the leadership pillar, and we launched and, and sent over to AAN last year this entire two years of Nurses on Boards Coalition to get 10,000 nurses on boards by 2020. Wow. Um, and we're probably going to do that because uh, 200 per state times 50 is 10,000. And most governors have at least... 150 kinds of task forces and whatever. So you don't have to be in the boardroom of this hospital your first time out, but you could be on your PTA board, your water board, your any other kind of board, uh, faculty. That's how you start. So I think everything's an opportunity and you need mm -hmm. to take it. Um, you do need to work overtime. Mm -hmm. I was packing lunches at, I mean, I had, we were raising five kids when I got my masters and I would wake up at two o'clock in the morning drooling over the book you know I'd have fallen asleep my head would be on the kitchen table and I'd be making lunches at one o'clock in the morning and stuff like that I mean it's a stretch like I said it's a stretch and uh, you have to do that but when the opportunity comes mm -hmm. and like I mentioned uh, that gentleman Victor after I did one or two things right he would say "Do you have any other ideas and then I thought this guy We'll go with it. Mm -hmm. And so I started thinking of ideas. And I would say, how about we do, you know, how about we put behavioral health up in the north side of the thing? And he'd go, really? Come back to me with something. And I'd type it up, back in the day, type it up, <laughs> take it in there. He'd say, how much money do you need? I made up the budget. And if it worked, mm -hmm. he'd do it again, do it again, do it again. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, mm -hmm. that that's... Mm -hmm. Just something you should do. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. if get anywhere near being able to do that and mm -hmm. try that. Great. It works Thanks. all the time. Yeah. Other questions? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. You both talked about seizing the opportunities mm -hmm. and taking risk, but talk to me about when you really felt vulnerable. All Kathy, you alluded to a little bit with your public all speaking. All the time. <laughs> but, but you really come across as very strong and confident. But we know that there's those moments of vulnerability. And I'd like you to talk to that and how you work through that. Go ahead. Why she asked you first? Yeah. That's, a very, that's a very good question. Um, 
I think for me, vulnerability is I, um, I have a strong need to feel prepared. And so for me, uh, being vulnerable is um, uh, being in situations just because of the complexity of the role and the complexity of the organizations, that people have a lot of expectations of you and have a lot of expectations in terms of what you know, what you understand about the not only the organization, but about all kinds of things. So I think the vulnerability that I have is uh, just f just preparing myself the best I can in the role, but just knowing there'd be times when I just have to do the best with the knowledge that I have and the experience. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for asking this question, because this is really a penetrating question. Um, I would say, when I said vul feeling vulnerable all the time, I don't mean that um, in a terribly negative way, but I would say the higher up you go and the more, the broader you lead, the more vulnerable you, you feel and you are. I think that's just a fact. Mm -hmm. I would um, echo the fact of preparation. One of the reasons I don't sleep at night was because of raising all those crazy kids, but the other reason is um, I pack a lot into a day and I never go anywhere that I'm not prepared. I just don't do it. I, I have never done it. I have never done it. And uh, I watched a couple of, I won't name these other leaders, but there were a couple of leaders that were, you know, brand name leaders, you know, in um, younger, kind of the Linda Aikens and of their day. And I remember just being totally enamored with this one particular nursing leader. And enough that I followed her around. If I knew she was talking, I would go. And then I realized she would, um, she only changed, she gave the same speech everywhere. She only changed the title and she changed maybe the first line and the last line. And that bothered me so much. And that's like 40 years ago. I vowed I would never, 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 never do that. And I have never given the same speech twice, ever. I may have some anecdotes or I may do something. The other thing when you're talking about vulnerable is um, I mentioned that honesty and I put that up there. That's like a golden rule for me, not just the golden rule. But Jen will remember. Thank you. Safe home. We'll talk. Yeah. Um, Jen would even tell you in the thing. I've said, you know, there's a couple of things like honesty or whatever. So if I'm feeling vulnerable, I don't know, I tell the person who works for me or people work with me. I've always been straight up about that. And a lot of my bosses have said to me, I know, I know, don't tell me. And I said, don't ask me if you don't want to hear the real answer. And every boss I've ever had later on after I've left or whenever I went to the next thing, they've all told me they valued that. Most people are afraid because you're feeling vulnerable. And you feel like, God, if I tell them this, they're going to be really upset. That doesn't mean you be brutal and obnoxious, but you can be kind of straight up. And I think that relieves, for me, it relieves that vulnerability because it takes the tension. It's like an argument with your mother or your husband or your sister or brother or something. That tension's there. If you don't deal with it, it never mm -hmm. goes away. And when you're a leader, I think that's a bad thing. And, you know, take it up all the way up now to Turkey and Putin. That tension's there and you don't address it, bad mm -hmm. things happen. And that's because one party is vulnerable. So it's a very pensive question you ask, but um, mm -hmm. that's been my kind of way of dealing with it over the years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh-huh. Um, I have a question for either one of you. I just want to know you're both very bu busy people. And I'm thinking of my life, and I think of um, a circle, and I think of um, probably um, maybe 14 arrows hitting at different trajectories, and they're all due yesterday. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's very challenging. And I'm trying to finish a PhD that should have been done yesterday. I'm almost done, but it gets in the way of my job. And um, more recently, we've, we've had to make, make changes, you know, in the college. We have many students, probably more than we can actually accommodate, given the uh, space in some of the rooms. It, it's, it's challenging to get a room where you can fit everyone. But um, I'm just wondering, how do you decide, you know, what to do um, first? Because it's all equally important. And I feel more recently, 
um, I'm getting into situations where I'm not the expert. And I have never in my life gotten up to do a lecture without being an expert in the field. And it's a little scary to me, even if it's at the gem level. Because, you know, I wasn't, I didn't grow up that way, but I'm learning and I'm working hard, but I just don't know how to do it all. And I got to finish the PhD. <laughs> thank you. Well, um, I'll give you a couple of real life stories and anecdotes, and thank you for being so uh, honest about your situation. Um, you got to give up some things. Um, so I never finished my PhD. So my mother got sick. I got a life-threatening disease, and I never got back to Columbia. So here I am, right? Um, so that can happen. Um, I often say I got my PhD on the ground, and I believe that because I really had a lot of jobs and covered a lot of ground in my life. Second thing is I made decisions along the way uh, when I had to balance family and, and the job and going to school. And none of it worked. Part-time school, part-time work, full-time work, part-time school, full-time, it doesn't work. It's a killer. It's a killer. Um, but I, I left a job and I worked nights because the kids were, you know, a certain age. That retarded me, but I guess I caught up later on. You do have to make certain decisions. I was thinking I should have told you guys the story coming over here because it was just Thanksgiving. The way I did it when I was at the height of in the hospital, uh, which was, you know, you were on call, what was I, on call 15 years and all that kind of stuff. Uh, thanks Every Thanksgiving, this was part of my communicate, also part of my, it's a, you know, it's a sport. Um, I chose a different kid and after five or six years ago, can I go, can I go? I would put the turkey in the oven at five or six o'clock in the morning, and then I'd grab a kid, and I'd make rounds at the hospital and go to every single floor. And then after dinner, I'd go see the 3 to 11, and at night, after everybody else went to bed and the dishes were done, I went back and said Happy Thanksgiving to the night people. And that accomplished a lot of what I told you. You know, it was like, I'm telling you, when I left that hospital, it was like a wake. I was there a month, and there were just people coming in from, you know, the cafeteria. I always remember you came, whatever. Um, you make different decisions, and you have to switch something up. So when you're going to school, you have to tell everybody else, you know, so your volunteer works out the door, you can't do that, and you have to negotiate that with your boss, because really you cannot do it all. This work-life balance thing is really cute. It's a nice phrase. All my children are trying to do it, and they're in their 40s. Uh, it's almost impossible with children and a family and a big job. So I just choice. Just mm -hmm. make choice. But try to figure out like something like that, that if you make the choice, the trade-off mm -hmm. is that you're still doing your job, some mm -hmm. aspect, just a little different. Mm -hmm. I have a similar response to that. And I, I can't speak to all the decisions I've made in my life, but in particular for putting myself out there to run for president-elect, I understood the magnitude of the role. And seriously, the minute I came back from convention after knowing that, um, that I had been elected, I sat down and I wrote a list of all the things. First of all, what am I paid to do? What do I volunteer to do? And I'm one of 12 children. and primarily re the only nurse in the family and primarily responsible for my 83-year-old mother's care. So I decided at that time that not only did I need to look at everything and figure out what could I give up, but I, what was the impetus for me was that I not only wanted to have the job, I not only wanted to make the time to be able to meet the demands of the job, but actually I wanted to enjoy it too. Because how many people in your life get the opportunity to do that? And I just knew that in order to be able to do that, some things had to go, and some things that I en enjoyed very much. So I started, where I started with was volunteer service and looking at wh what could I give up. And it took me almost two years to, to reorganize things. I give a lot of credit to my department chair, Liz Carlson, who actually is very gracious with the time in the college to see where I could, you know, where my responsibilities could free up. And then, you know, we all have families. And I sat down with the family and said, you know, 
and I would have to say, also in making the decision, I thought even in before the opportunity to run is to actually had some of those conversations ahead of time to know that I would get the support that I need. Otherwise, I'm not sure I would have done it because mm -hmm. I would not want to take the responsibility and not be able to position myself uh, in in a you know put myself in a good place to do a good job and to enjoy the experience. Mm -hmm. right. I did sit down with my children at the kitchen table before I took the hospital job because I had been in academia and I said if mommy does this this is what life is going to look like if mommy does that this is what life's going to look like and believe it or not they voted for the hospital job yeah. but you know what to this day remember we used to go to mommy's hospital it became my <laughs> hospital right <laughs> and um, you know they learned something management mm -hmm. I used to say Victor doesn't like mommy to be late you can't be late for school. You know, it's mm -hmm. exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I thought, mm -hmm. you know, that was a good example, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much for those words of wisdom. Um, very inspirational. We, we do have to wrap up now. We do have time for more conversation. Um, feel free to uh, network more, and uh, I'm sure you're both available for follow-up questions. Sure. Thank you so much thank again. So much. Thank you very good, much. good evening. Thank you.